life in Pompeii was stopped in its tracks. Today, excavations of this once booming city offer the best look anywhere at ancient Roman life. For archaeologists, Pompeii was a shake-and-bake windfall. Ancient Rome controlled the entire Mediterranean Sea. That made it a kind of free trade zone, and Pompeii was an important port town. It was big, 20,000 people. It was an important commercial center. Imagine this square, just busy with market activity. And because it was a port, it was a kind of a sailor's quarter, and that meant it was fun. Lots of bars, baths, brothels, restaurants, and places of entertainment. The main square, or forum, was Pompeii's commercial, religious, and political center. The Curia housed the government. It was built of brick and mortar, a Roman invention. It was originally faced with gleaming marble. The basilica, or law court, was nearby. Here you see the basilica floor plan that medieval churches adopted after Christianity became legal. In good Roman style, the city was well organized, with a grid street plan contained within its walls. Remains of homes give a glimpse into Roman lifestyles. The house of Veti, the home of a wealthy merchant, shows the typical layout of a mansion. Its colonnaded atrium, with formal garden and water flowing to give freshness, was ringed by colorfully frescoed rooms. For a better understanding of life at Pompeii, Italian archaeologist Gaetano Manfredi is taking us on a walk. Pompeii's impressive baths were just past the gymnasium. After working out, Romans would relax, be pampered, and enjoy the social scene in a public bath. This was the tepidarium. So people coming from gymnasium after sport, they, will, they, were, they were massaged by the slaves. Inside the niches all around, there were oils, creams, perfumes for the body massages. A part of the ceiling is still original, and so we can see how beautiful decorated was once all the ceiling. They were massaged by the slaves 25 or 30 minutes before going to the sauna, because tepidarium means lukewarm bath. After the tepidarium, there was the calidarium, which was the hot bath. Beside this wall, there was a room where the slaves made the fire. The hot air went underneath the double floor, because this floor is supported by little columns, and the hot air went between the double walls. There was a circulation of hot air, and just when everything was really hot, they opened the water of a fountain over here, <laughs> the water slowly fell on the floor, the floor was hot, and this produced a steam. The last stop was the frigidarium, the cold bath. Eh? As we still do today, after the sauna, to harder the muscles and for the body circulation, the cold bath. Water was abundant in this well-plumbed city. Fountains provided a social center at intersections, and a steady stream of water flushed the chariot-rutted streets clean. So why the stones in the street here? Well, there was always water flowing along the roads and washing the roads. So that's why the sidewalk all oh, over okay. and the stepping stones. So the, the pedestrians yes, walk across the cross get road, wet. avoiding wet feet. Very smart. While the site is evocative, the horrors of that day in 79 AD are hard to imagine. Thousands of people died in this eruption. Here we have the cast of those people. Uh, you know, during the excavations, sometimes the archaeologists fell under the volcanic materials some empty spaces left by the decomposition of bodies. And so what they did, they injected the liquid plaster in these empty spaces. The liquid plaster took the form of the previous bodies, and when it dried up, the archaeologists cleaned all the ash away and appeared the body in the same position the man was when he died 2,000 years ago. One day a thriving city, the next day, this. 